Beside one of Scotland's most dazzling creations lived one of the nation's most dazzling creative minds. Just three weeks ago, I went to Ian Banks' home on the shores of the Firth of Forth. It's where he wrote some of the most compelling fiction in a generation. And it was where he was to face his own death from cancer. This was to be his final interview. It's been almost 30 years since Ian Banks' remarkable debut, The Wasp Factory. It marked him out as a major new talent. Over the course of 29 books, he created an extraordinary body of work with a very particular point of view. He combined both critical acclaim and popular success. His books are clever, controversial, funny, warm, political and astoundingly imaginative. They reflect the personality of the man. Usually with my male central characters, there will be basically me, but in an idealised form, i.e. Uh, taller, handsomer, younger, uh, thinner of waist and more successful listed ladies. Nowhere was the strength of that personality more evident than in the blog he published in April. He announced he was officially very poorly and had asked his long-term girlfriend to do him the honour of becoming his widow. Ian Banks' final novel, The Quarry, is published next week. One of the main characters is dying of cancer. It's a visceral portrayal of a man furious at his approaching death. Ian, I am officially very poorly. That statement sounds like the first line of an Ian Banks novel. <laughs> That's what it does, actually, yeah. Um, and this idea that your novels are really like a hand grenade, and yet you were delivered of your own extraordinary hand grenade in your life. Um, your first reaction to that was what? Um, I think it was in, on the lines of old oh, bugger. Um, it's one of these things, I guess, in a sense, you, you rehearse in your head. I think anyone kind of does it. You, you sort of game it, you play it, you think about, you know, how would I feel, how will I react if, you know, a loved one is, uh, well, dies or um, is, is delivered of a verdict, you know, prognosis like that, as it were. And I think especially as a writer, and I think probably within the creative field, act actors are probably the same. When you have to um, either take on the part of someone who's dying or, or dead, well, you know, uh, um, if you're writing about people who are facing death, then you automatically, you kind of have to embody that. You have to take that in quite seriously. And obviously there are professions that are very much involved with death, well, you know, funeral directors and so on, and people in A&E &E and, um, you know, the ambulance drivers and so on, you know, the paramedics that, that come with the ambulance. Uh, and I think you probably find a preponderance of people like that who are sort of pre-prepared, or at least as pre-prepared as you can be with, with your reaction. And uh, I just took it as just, you know, bad luck, basically. Uh, it did strike me almost immediately. My atheist uh, sort of thing kicked in and I thought, ha, if I was a god bother, I'd be thinking, why me, God? What have I done to deserve this? You know, I don't know why I saw it turned into a Jewish person there, but in my mind... Um, and I thought, at least I'm free of that. At least I can simply, you know, sort of treat it as bad luck and get on with it. Humour has been at the heart. Very, very black humour has been the heart of so much of your work. I mean, does it help you get through different stages of this, just finding the humour in things? I guess so. It's not something you kind of do deliberately. I guess it's just there. It's an automatic reaction. And yes, obviously, when the... The Wasp Factory, going right back to the start, that was, you know, it was always meant to be a black comedy. That was very much the idea. And uh, I, uh, I occasionally get asked if I could be a character in one of my novels, you know, who would it be? <laughs> it was quite a limited choice, given the rather unpleasant ends that, you know, some of them come to. But were you, so the shockwaves that came from the announcement have been phenomenal. Mm. Did they surprise you? Uh, a stone would be closer to it. Um, yeah, I mean, we deliberately released information on the day that we were about to head off to Venice with our pals. And uh, we wouldn't be coming back for 10 days, and I was pretty certain I'd be old news by then. Um, I think, you know, let's be fair here, though, it was a slow news day. <laughs> oh, I think you're underestimating uh, well, your uh, impact. Uh, but I, I thought, you know, because we, we were just uh, coming back through the Alps, heading from Venice to Paris, uh, we got news of uh, Thatcher dying. Now, if 
Thatcher had died the same day that I put out my announcement, I wouldn't have been anywhere near the front page. I'd be lucky to get a diary entry on page 27 or whatever, an equivalent on the BBC News and so on. Um, so, yeah, I mean, being on the front page of, you know, several newspapers was, um, that was kind of gobsmacking. The impact yeah. on people's lives, were you surprised at that? Oh, yeah, oh, that, that came mostly through the... Um, the website, our, our, our pal uh, Martin Belk had this great idea for having this website so people could express what they wanted to express. And uh, I've, I did say I'd read all of the posts, which I'm, I'm doing. I, I just read page 86. Yeah. Uh, so only another hundred and a bit to go. Uh, and yeah, it was astonishing. I'm still, I mean, I'm only on day two now, about two days after the announcement. So, because obviously when you're in this situation, you're constantly trying to find the positives, you know. Uh, few and far between who they are. Uh, but one positive that did strike me was I'm getting all this love and admiration now rather than you know, people standing around talking about me awfully well when I'm dead, you know, at the wake or uh, that sort of thing. So it's been great to, to appreciate that now when I'm still alive. Um, you wrote The Quarry thinking it would be coming out this October or so yeah. forth and they're rushing it out. So tell me a bit about the writing of The Quarry. Well, it's um, the narrator is an 18-year-old uh, boy with who's on one or two different spectra, as it were, um, possibly Asperger's being one of them. Um, but in, in a sense, the main character is his dad, who's dying of cancer. <laughs> uh, but I was 87,000 words into the book before I discovered the bad news. I had no inkling. Uh, so it wasn't as though this is a response to the, the condition, to the disease or anything. Um, and the book had been kind of ready to go. And then <clears throat> 10,000 words from the end, as it turned out, I suddenly discovered that I had cancer. I've really got to stop doing my research too late. This is <laughs> such a bad idea. But the big thing, one of the big things about the quarry, I mean, there's, there's lots to talk about it, but one of the big things is that Guy, who has cancer and is aggressive cancer, mm -hmm. is absolutely raging against the dying of the light. Oh, yes. Uh -huh. I mean, he is furious. Mm -hmm. Well, I think, yeah, and in a sense, justifiably so. Um, first of all, he feels he hasn't done much with his life. Doesn't apply to me. You know, I've had a uh, brilliant life, basically. And uh, I think I've been more, even including the, the news of the cancer, I think I've still been more lucky than unlucky. And uh, But also, you know, I've written 29 books. I'm leaving a substantial body of work behind me. And how long I'll survive, who knows, but... Um, I can be quite sort of you know proud of that, and I am you know. So, but also he's got this thing. He hates the idea of the world going on without him, you know, which is kind of stupid. But that's just that's just part of his character. Whereas pff, that doesn't concern me in the least. That seems a bizarre thing to resent, you know. I take the fucking point that if you have a choice of being negative or positive about something like this, you might as well be positive can't do any harm, even if it borders on self-delusion and happy, clappy fuckwittery. But there's a funny fucking thing about having terminal cancer. I mean, apart from the hilarity of all the pain and the weakness and the fear and the general humiliation of the disease and the fucking treatments, he breaks off to cough. It makes it hard to be fucking positive about any fucking thing with the notable exception of feeling positive that you're going to fucking die. You're 87,000 words into the quarry then, and what changed after your diagnosis in the writing and the revision? Um, well, the first thing I did, I'd, I'd take my laptop and I uh, first got the original bad news, as it were, in uh, Kirkcaldy in the Victoria Hospital, and I'd taken my, my laptop and uh, just to, to... just so I might do a bit of work while I was there. Uh, I couldn't really be bothered. I'd uh, basically done my work, my words for the day anyway. So, uh, so having got this news, uh, I sat there in bed and I wrote. The, there's a bit where guy says, "I shall not be you know, upset to leave this stupid bloody country and this idiotic bloody human race and this idiotic world and all the rest of it." It's a, it's a proper rant, you know. Um, I think it yeah, kind of changed places. Originally, it was exactly where I got the news. It was exactly <laughs> 87,000. Um, it was changed slightly because my editor suggested it actually be more powerful in <clears throat> the uh, sort of address on camera that he does uh, uh, in the recording. So uh, we, we changed that. that, that if he does a recording into a tape. Ah, right. Yeah. 
And um, but that was it. That was my one. So I thought, well, I remember sitting there and thought, you're a writer, you know, you, you've got to use some of this feelings you, you're having right now. You, you know, use it to, you know, go to town on the whole idea. So uh, uh, some of my most sort of darkest thoughts at that point were channeled into that, that bit of writing, you know. Other than that, that was kind of it. That was out of my system. Just the book rolled on, you know, because I knew, always knew what was going to be happening. You know, it was fairly well planned out. So that was the only extra bit, you know, it was just me being all bitter. <laughs> Getting your bitterness out in the character of Guy. Ah, ideal um, medium, yeah. And I shall not miss being part of a species lamentably ready to resort to torture, rape, and mass murder just because some other poor fucker or fuckers is or are slightly different from those intent upon doing such harm. Be it because they happen to worship a very slightly different set of superstitious idiocies, possess skin occupying a non-identical position on a Pantone racial color wheel, or had the fucking temerity to pop out of a womb on the other side of a river, ocean, mountain range, other major geographical feature, or indeed just a straight line drawn across the desert by some bored and ignorant bureaucrat umpteen thousand miles away and a century ago. None of these things shall I miss. Frankly, it's a relief to be getting short of the necessity of watching such bollocks play out. I would still rather have the choice, mark you, but as this would appear to be being denied me, I am making the best of a bad job and looking on the bright side. I shall be free at last of that nagging, persistent sensation that I am, for the most part, surrounded by fucking idiots. It just seems uncanny that you should be writing a book about terminal cancer mm. as you were given a diagnosis. Not only that, only Ian Banks could get the diagnosis, sit with his laptop, and write about it there and then. Oh, no, I disagree. I think um, perhaps the majority of writers would uh, would do that. In the hospital, with your laptop? Oh, well, it, it was there, you know. <laughs> was like, Bugger! <laughs> so you do have to... You know, I think it's a natural thing for a writer just to, to express themselves. I mean, you might not do it with the idea of immediate inclusion into the into the novel, if, you, if that's what you're working on or whatever, but um, because... You know, and I think it was just coincidence, you know. I think it's just... Uh, it was the way things work. I happened to have chosen that, uh, but that subject. But in the actual, in, in the quarry itself, you're very unflinching mm. about the impact of cancer, you know, even, you know, day-to-day -day impact mm. of cancer. In fact, in a very Ian Banks way, you kind of relish some of that detail. Damn, it shows. <laughs> um, well, yeah, I think I, I don't, you can't really pussyfoot around <laughs> a subject like that, and especially, especially not when you've got someone like Guy who is he's just a character that he is. He's never going to, you know, sort of shy away from stuff, you know. But people say that you, um, you that dark side, that kind of um, thrawn, and you know, thrawn is the way I see it in me. Your character is often very thrawn. Uh -huh. To me, in a way, that that is very much about, it is about, it's about Scotland. Mm. Oh, yeah, definitely, yeah. Um, I mean, I've always, uh, well, a lot. Of, I didn't realize how Scottish I was in a sense for a long time. But I remember shocking my parents when we were still here in, in the ferry the first time. So it would be before the age of nine, uh, telling my mum and dad I felt more British than Scottish. <laughs> you know, what? <laughs> you know, no son of mine, get out. I think that kind of changed. You know, you kind of, kind of come to realize how much of your, your culture is, you know, specifically Scottish. Uh, and I think it profoundly started to change um, when Thatcher came to power mm -hmm. and realised that the era of one nation, you know, conservatism was gone. That was it. Uh, in a sense, even more when Labour stopped being Labour mm -hmm. and became New Labour and became big fans of privatisation, etc. I think Scottish people are just kind of automatically, you know, more communitarian, more socialist, mm -hmm. if you like. Uh, I think that kind of has to be... It's only fair that that, that is reflected in... You know, the governments that we have, and we're you know part of the way down that road, but uh, but, but I uh, think yeah. 
it, it seems to be your feeling about it seems to be more visceral now. I mean, mm. you're writing the Guardian about uh, the whole UKIP experience as well. I mean, do you think your own views have ha not hardened but um, become much more solid in the last year about Scotland? I think, well, I think it's been a process that's you know gone taken longer than that. I think it's um, you know good. Well, in a sense, it's going back, you know, to uh, maybe 20 odd years, or whatever. I mean, uh, when I stopped voting Labour, uh, I was sort of casting around for who to, to vote for. So I was just kind of voting for whoever had the biggest, you know, any sort of relatively serious party had any sort of chance of being in power that had the most left wing policies. And that's why I started voting for the SNP. It was a purely pragmatic, you know, political, not nationalist thing at all. Uh, and it's been a, just a gradual, you know, progression in a sense from that to uh, becoming more nationalist uh, about it because I think it's another way to make sense of the difference. Do you think there is a role of a writer in cultural change to kind of help the readers through through stories but not necessarily through you know not through kind of evangelizing? Mm. Um, yeah you have got to be very careful about that it's very easy to you know when you're a writer to overstate the um, you know, the, the influence that writers have, you know, I think we're all a bit egotistical that way. I think, well, yes, what I think is incredibly important, you should listen. Yeah, yeah it just, doesn't stop me having the odd rant. Look at Dead Air. Oh, I know. That's, oh, that is a book full of rants. That was the whole idea, was to have a sort of uh, a left-wing shock jock. <laughs> <laughs> I leaned closer to the mic, lowering my voice. Phil closed his eyes. Thought for today, listener, for our American cousins. Phil groaned. If you do find and kill Bin Laden, assuming he is the piece of scum behind this, or even if you just find his body... I paused, watching the hands on the studio clock flick silently towards the top of the hour. Phil had taken his glasses off. Wrap him in pigskin and bury him under Fort Knox. I can even tell you how deep 1,350 feet, that's 110 stories. Another pause. Don't worry about that noise, listeners. It's just the sound of my producer's head gently thumping on the desk. Oh, one last thing. As it stands, what happened last week wasn't an attack on democracy. If it was, they'd have crashed a plane into Al Gore's house. That's it for today. Talk to you tomorrow, if I'm still here. News next after these vital pieces of consumerist propaganda. That's great fun. I loved writing that book. Um, uh, but yeah, I think um, you have to be careful. I think you're more likely to be reflecting more than leading, put it that way. Uh, you might see yourself as a figurehead, but the figurehead doesn't produce the motive energy. It's the sales that do. But but the character of a nation is often underpinned by the the the, the culture of it, including the writing. And if, if I think about writers, um, like um, House of the Green Shutters mm. uh, and Lanark, mm. um, as you're the to me you're the kind of inheritor of that. I mean, in a way that there's 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 kind of wonderful kind of humanity in the bleakness sometimes. Mm. Um, I don't know the inheritor of. I mean, I'm. Deeply uh, uh, humbled and <laughs> put in the same category as Alistair Gray, but he's still around. In fact, looks like he's going to outlive me as well. You know, um, so I can't really have inherited that in that in that but sense. In Lanark, from but, that, the, yeah. the inheritor of Lanark rather than him. I, uh, I, I wouldn't. I don't think I can accept that. I, it's my. I think it's the single greatest Scottish novel of the twentieth century, and. Uh, uh, no, that would be that would be egotism a step a, a step too far even for my egotistical you know sort of outlook. But what did Lanark mean to you? I, uh, oh, I think it kind of taught me. Although I was still, you know, um, I suppose I was still learning as a writer. I certainly was, in fact. But um, it kind of reminded me of the freedom you could give yourself. Uh, and the ability to mix genre to include fantasy and science fiction in a sense and. Uh, means you know a Bildungsroman and uh, almost a, almost a historical novel. Um, it was and it's also the forthrightness of uh, Alistair's voice in there. It's so clear and it struck me over the years that the writers that I most admire their writing is about clarity. Alistair Gray, 
achieves that. Uh, Mike Harrison, M. John Harrison, um, whose ear I bent about a week ago, telling him uh, I met up down in London, and uh, rather than send him a letter, I just told him, you know, that I thought he was a bloody genius. And um, but you've written to Alistair and, Gray as well. I, I wrote to Alistair Gray, yes, a, a fanboy letter, basically, yeah. uh, and said, I know this is gushing. I know how hard it is to reply to gushing stuff, so. Do you have to, for you have to reply honest, you know. I didn't even put my, <clears throat> my own address on, yeah. you know, to kind of encourage him not to. Um, nevertheless, he did reply, and uh, it was just a lovely, lovely letter. It was really nice and beautifully put together. You can see the guy's an artist, even when he's you know, writing and just writing a, a, a letter. It's gorgeous. Uh, let's go, just go back to the Wasp Factory for a minute. And from the very get go, uh, you talk about it as a black comedy. Mm. But it's a deeply moving book as well about about a twisted childhood. Oh yeah, it's meant to you know, basically press as many buttons as, as, as was possible, you know, and kind of you know, cheerfully going for the grand guignol, you know, sort of feel as well. Uh, um, it was an extraordinary. I mean, it was your first published novel. Absolutely, yeah. And it uh, absolutely that was a hand grenade. It was, yeah. It was uh, it was the right book at the right time, and it got it. By God, it got me noticed, you know. <laughs> And, um, you know, I'd been anticipating you know, a slow build-up. I thought if I was lucky, I'd get another couple of novels published and maybe, it was if, hopefully, if they sold more and more, then I might be able to um, give up my day job. And instead, The Wasp Factory was, you know, just out there and just a huge sensation. And uh, all the adverse publicity was, if anything, more you know, productive <laughs> than the, the praise that it got. Uh, and I don't know, maybe if it had come out a year before or a year after, it wouldn't have had the same effect. I don't know, but... Uh, it certainly worked, um, and I'm still very proud of it. And there's none of the books I'm not proud of. There's ones that I think I could have done better with. I think uh, I still think Canal Dreams is the, the run to the litter. But um, yeah, I'm I'm still very very proud of the Lost Factory. And it was I, you know, what you were saying earlier about, about the um, about the quarry. I realised that as I was sitting those couple of days um, uh, coming up with the ideas that I thought. Oh, this is looking a bit like Wasp Factory. And I thought, well, that's OK. You know, you, that's, you can, you're allowed to have themes. You're not always just repeating yourself if you have similarities between your novels. And I kind of just I liked the idea of you know, playing around with, with that and about the father-son relationship. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, But I mean, there's a bit, and you can almost see the workings <laughs> in the quarry. Um, hmm, yeah, you know what I mean. Um, yeah. When... Kit talks about this thing about he's got about trying to measure people accurately. And one of, the, one of the methods that he resorts to is wandering into the room at night when they're asleep and trying to measure them. And how frustrating it is that almost nobody's you know, yeah. lies, stretched, lies stretched out like that and everybody sort of curls mm. up, you know. Um, and he, but he, makes, he goes to some pain to say, but it's not like I'm a mad axe murderer or anything. And that was almost there just because of the loss factor. Yes. So you're reassured that... You know, Kit is Kit's not uh, going to be bumping not, people not off. Not murderous. Yeah, no, yeah. Kit's not. Kit's a wonderful, gentle human being. But then, I mean, just going to, into some of the kind of set pieces in the Wasp Factory, I mean, the death of Esmeralda. I mean, extraordinary, because, I mean, you love kites as well, didn't you? Oh, yeah, I used to make my own kites, and it was... Um, I used to... got big black bin liners and take them to, you know, uh, canes and take them up to the hills above Greenock and fly them, you know... So uh, I, I just remember your um, good old windy day in Inverclyde and going, what the hell? And almost getting you know, sort of pulled off my feet. I thought, hmm, if you were lighter, if you were a child, you would be pulled off your feet. I thought, hmm. And because I, you know, from way back then, I still wanted, that was all of my ambition was to be a writer. You just think, well, that's a way to kill somebody off if they're quite small, you know. Esmeralda looked round one last time at me, giggling, and I laughed back. Then I let the lines go. The winch hit her in the small of the back and she yelped. Then she was dragged off her feet as the lines pulled her and the loops tightened around her wrists. I staggered back, partly to make it look Good on the off chance there was somebody watching, and partly because letting go of the winch had put me off balance. I fell to the ground as Esmeralda left it forever. The kite just kept snapping and flapping and flapping and snapping, and it hauled the girl off the earth and into the air 
winch and all. I lay on my back and watched it for a second, then got up and ran after her as fast as I could, again, just because I knew I couldn't catch her. She was screaming and waggling her legs for all she was worth, but the cruel loops of nylon had her about the wrists. The kite was in the jaws of the wind, and she was already well out of reach, even if I had wanted to catch her. I ran and ran, jumping off a dune and rolling down its seaboard face, watching the tiny struggling figure being hoisted farther and farther into the sky as the kite swept her away. Childhood, often fraught and damaged, plays a central role in Ian Banks' stories. By contrast, his own was very happy, and mostly spent here in North Queensferry. And it's where he returned to live almost 20 years ago. This was a great place to grow up. I mean, even if I've only had like indifferent parents, your average parents, um, uh, it was such an adventure playground. There was even more of the military stuff left around, the old um, First World War emplacements and Second World War uh, anti-aircraft gun emplacements. Um, it was just a great place to wander around. It's almost an island. It's got that lovely self-contained feel about it. It's you know, just a three quarters of an island. You know, uh, it's wee peninsula, but it, for uh, the scale of a child, you know, it was absolutely perfect. It seemed huge. But I mean, even just being in the midst of these two great engineering mm. feats, fantastic. Uh, it was, yeah. I got to see the, the road bridge being built, and that was uh, that was fun. Just, just watching the whole thing come together, and we saw it almost to the end. But uh, it was always this one. It was always the, the fourth bridge, you know, just yep. the rail bridge itself. That was always the how most. wonderful it is. And it, there was something inevitable that you would have to use the bridge. I think in your so. Fiction. Yeah. Uh huh. It was. Um, it's one of the almost yeah the only um, book idea that came to me in a dream. I just had this dream, I was living in Faversham in Kent at the time, and I had this dream about a gigantic version of the bridge, of, of this bridge, um, just on a different scale and, and the size of a city in a sense. And uh, I just woke up thinking, right, oh, that's cool, oh, that's, that's nice, you know. It would be nice if all the books came that way, we were totally effortless. If he'd had less than the legal limit to drink, he would take the Quattro out and drive to North Queensferry to sit beneath the great dark bridge, listening to the water lap against the stones and the trains rumble overhead. He would smoke a joint or just breathe the fresh air. If he felt pity for himself, it was only one timid, tentative part of his mind that felt so. There was another part of him which seemed like a hawk or an eagle, hungry and cruel and fanatically keen-eyed. Self-pity lasted a matter of seconds in the open. Then the bird of prey fell on it, tearing it, ripping it. The bird was the real world, a mercenary dispatched by his embarrassed conscience, the angry voice of all the people in the world that vast majority who were worse off than he was. Just common sense. He discovered, to his knowing, almost righteous dismay, that the bridge was not painted end to end over a neat three-year period. It was done piecemeal, and the cycle lasted anything between four and six years. Another myth bites the dust, he thought, par for the course. I think it had been such a large part of my life for so long. It was this gigantic symbol um, that had affected me in all sorts of ways. I've always been, I think it's also there in the science fiction. I've just always liked big structures, you know. <laughs> when you root some of your work in Scotland, that's one part of your imagination. But the other part of your imagination is creating completely different worlds. And for example, the culture, this kind of slightly, well, very sarcastic kind of super group, as it were, um, that are, are, are gonna fly around the universe sorting things out. Uh -huh. 
you like the idea of creating different worlds. Oh, I love it. Yeah, it's this enormous freedom you get in science fiction that you can just you, like, you can go anywhere, do anything. It's, it's that simple. It's, um, the things that I love and things that I, I tend to read most are science fiction and, and you know, mainstream literature. And those are what I love to write as well. And it's uh, been a privilege in a way to be able to get away with it you know, for an entire career, to be able to, to do both. You, know, you, always, you do kind of feel sometimes you're doing the thing you're told, you know, the military people say you should never do, which is write a, you know, wars on two fronts. But um, you know, I think as long as you write fast enough, you know, right? Very know, fast. Also, well, a book a year, which is not madly fast. You know, Teddy Pratchett used to mm. way outstrip me in terms of you know, production. Um, uh, and I think that, uh, yeah, as long as you don't... It means that you know, people are only ever a book away, a year, a two years away, as it were, from you know, their genre of choice. They don't read both. So, uh, um, yeah, that's been you know, just fun, basically. But, but the, is the idea behind the culture to imagine a world that you think, in a way, would be better? Yes, oh, it's um, didactic. It's... Um, it's my idea of what is as close as possible, as close as possible as anything remotely like us as a species could get to in terms of being, if not an actual utopia, then a sort of functioning as good as we're going to get utopia. Um, having said that, I think we, I don't think humanity is up to it, quite frankly. I think we're too nasty. Uh, we may find that there are genes that code for xenophobia, uh, the genes, well, it's the genes that code for, you know, racism and sexism, uh, for you know, anti-Semitism, for um, Islamophobia, all the, all the xenophobic things, all the things that, where we decide that like, we're this one good privileged group and those bastards over there, well, we hate them. Um, and all the excuses that we find, we find, you know, to be so deeply, deeply unpleasant to each other. Are you, but do you find yourself despairing about humanity at the moment? Uh, a wee bit, yes, frankly, yeah. It's, it's, um, yeah, I think just in terms of the, the world situation, it's not looking good. We haven't really dealt with the, the last um, economic disaster uh, properly. You know, it's, it, we're just really heading up for another one. You know, already the, you know, this government, you know, the, the British government, is um, stoking up the next housing bubble. It's just ludicrous. It's insanity. Um, and, you know, Obama has been a bit of a disappointment. Uh. On Earth, one of the things that a large proportion of the locals is most proud of is this wonderful economic system, which, with a sureness and certainty so comprehensive, one could almost imagine the process bears some relation to their limited and limiting notions of either thermodynamics or God, all food, comfort, energy, shelter, space, fuel and sustenance gravitates naturally and easily away from those who need it most and towards those who need it least. Indeed, those on the receiving end of such largesse are often harmed unto death by its arrival, though the effects may take years and generations to manifest themselves. You make a statement in the state of the art about how, how could they have created a society where, you know, those who have get more and those who don't have get even less. I mean, it's like a credo that, you know, you believe very strongly that we've got it wrong. Oh, absolutely, yeah. I think, I mean, um, the thing is, I mean, it's not impossible to correct things. Uh, I love the way people talk about, you know, blue sky thinking. And yet, if you try to suggest anything properly radical, they just think you're completely insane. You can imagine, for example, a different form of capitalism. If you're not going to have a proper thoroughgoing revolution, I think, a capitalism that didn't allow joint stock companies, where there was no such thing as a public limited company, uh, where all... Uh, well, what you'd have instead would be partnerships, in the proper old-fashioned sense, that, that there was unlimited liability. And uh, you wouldn't have this farcical belief that you can somehow turn a company into a person. And the, the debts of the company were purely, you know, uh, um, attached, to, attached you. to it, not to the people that started it. And who would have, but who would have benefited had it gone, gone well? It might you know, lead to a less dynamic form of capitalism, but arguably you know, the, the dynamic form of capitalism we've had has uh, kind of messed us up rather a lot. 
But you are fascinated about civilizations in the future. And I mean, you must mm. believe then, presumably, that out there somewhere in a galaxy far, mm. far away, there is life. Oh, probably, yes. I mean, there's so many stars in the galaxy and there's so many galaxies and you know, what we, we know of, what we can see of the, of the universe. It would just seem highly unlikely there's just us. Um, and we might not be that far away. It's one of the things I regret a great deal is that I'm not going to live long enough to see some of the results coming in from some of the really good telescopes we're going to be putting in space in particular that will actually be able to analyse the composition of exoplanets, uh, their atmosphere, and you'll be able to tell uh, whether they've, they've got life in them. You'll be able to... All you do is you get... You know, you know exactly what the spectrum is of the star, and as the star slips behind the planet, uh, the... Um, the, spectrum, the way the spectrum alters, in other words, what's been taken out of it, will tell you how much carbon, how much ox uh, uh, carbon dioxide and so on, how much oxygen, nitrogen, whatever, is in the in the atmosphere of that planet. And it's an astounding thing to think we're going to know this in, you know, 10, 20 years, you know. Yeah, it's damned annoying. <laughs> Are you kind of evangelising atheist in I've your I've been describing myself as an evangelical atheist for about 20 years, yes. <laughs> it's not enough to be sitting in the corner going, well, I know I'm right, I'm not going to tell anybody else. <laughs> no, 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 you have, to go, have to, you have to go up to people's doors and go, you know, how have you discovered the power of atheism, brother? You know, <laughs> I think it's much more effective. But what about, you don't... Um, there's not this tiny bit of agnosticism in there on the basis that if you think there are other lives on other planets, mm. I seem to remember you said something, damn, there might just be a god out there playing a trick on us. Oh, it could be. I think there, there has to be a sort of half a percent of, um, you know, of, of agnosticism in there just because you just never know. In a sense, because it seems so blatantly bloody obvious that there is no god, that it's all just another nonsense. It's, just, it's us expressing ourselves. Um, and, and as I was saying in that, in that piece about uh, expressing our fears and, and hopes and so on, that, yeah, you know, it could just be some gigantic cosmic joke. So. But, like, but like Christopher Hitchens, are you anti-theist? I mean, do you be, think that religion is actually actively evil? Uh, not necessarily, and certainly not all the time. Uh, it's a comfort to people, apart from anything else. You know, but you'd um, say a false comfort. Yeah, but again, you know, I, I, I keep coming back to the fact I could be wrong, you know. Um, and it's hard to know what else you'd put in, in place. In the end, I would love to see religion just wither away and, you know, just kind of um, be, be so exposed to, to reason and to you know, rationality mm -hmm. that uh, it would simply cease to be. Or would be a, my, very much a minority sport, as it were. Um, but you but have... it's actually evil. Well, it can be, yes. I mean, it, uh, it can certainly be... Things, evil such a... It's kind of an all-or-nothing world, isn't it? Mm -hmm. um, yes, it can be, you know. But, I mean, it turned out so good communism as well, for that matter. You know, there's terrible crimes against humanity, you know, um, committed in, in its name. It was supposed to be all about people, not, not about religion at all. But um, you actively rail against some, you know, the, 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 the practice of different countries. Mm. You talk about Judaism, but it's actually you're very anti Israel's politics, aren't you? So oh yeah, that's but that has different. to be kept separate. Yeah, from, quite different. Yeah. But you do actively, you know, campaign. You will not have your book sold in Israel, will mm. you? Yeah, for what it's worth. Yeah, you know, my little cultural boycott. I did the same thing once I realised that I could do it against South Africa, uh, but you know, to, to even less point there in the sense that it was a sporting boycott that kind of convinced a lot of South Africans. But uh, do you think it's important to make, however, a stand, however small it is? Cutting up your passport and sending it to Downing Street. I mean, were you were you just annoyed that afternoon to the extent that that was the only thing you thought you could do to make your protest? Oh, no, clear? I, I did think about it. It was it was a fairly big step, you know. Um, but um, I just felt ashamed to be British. I didn't want to. I I kind of come to despise the symbol of Britishness. You know, this thing where the Queen graciously granted you the ability to travel abroad. Thank you very bloody much. Um, and also, you automatically become, you know, sort of an, a minor level, an ambassador for your country as soon as you travel, as soon as you travel abroad. And I just didn't want to, to be doing that. And but you were very um, actively anti, for example, the invasion of Iraq and so forth. Mm -hmm. I mean, that was really in the nature of your protest, wasn't it? Absolutely, yeah. I just thought it was an unbelievably stupid. Well, it was immoral, unnecessary, and it was illegal. Simple as that. And um, the motives of the people who were promoting it were just, they were simply lying. You know, Bush was lying, Blair was lying, they were all just lying. Well, yeah, bloody who? One good thing, 
one decent image to come out of the war, the sight of Saddam's statue being toppled. But even this is poorly done, messy and staged and unauthentic and incomplete. The pictures show the awful bloody thing starting to tilt. Then they cut, and when we see it next, they have beefier chains on it, and it's a U.S. vehicle doing the pulling, not the locals. The statue falls, but does not detach from its plinth. Two big metal reinforcing poles inside, anchoring it to the concrete. A U.S. flag is put on top before somebody realizes this might give out the wrong, for which read accurate, message, and an Iraqi flag is found instead. Oh, and still no WMDs used, deployed, anywhere near being deployed, or even found stored in some dusty desert bunker. But do you believe that if Scotland was independent, it should take its place, not as a world's policeman, but actually being actively involved through NATO or whatever? Uh, I don't know about through NATO. I certainly think uh, we could be, be a responsible part of the UN peacekeeping force. Of, you know, we have got quite a martial you know, sort of reputation and, and so on. Uh, but it would be you know, quite a major part of, a major reason for voting for independence would be to never be involved, hopefully, in any of these you know, disgraceful foreign adventures ever again. But what do you do about Syria? Uh, I, I don't bloody know. I really don't. I think it is so... Um, but do you believe we have a role at all in, in Syria? I think the role that we properly have is never to support these people in the first place. Is never, we should never have supported you know, Saddam Hussein. We should never have been in sort of clo uh, even relatively close terms that uh, became a, a Colonel Gaddafi, latterly. Uh, you should just oppose tyrants from the start. And you... I kind of despise this sort of real politic idea that my enemy's enemy is, is you know, my friend. Nonsense. You know, it, doesn't, it has no moral concept in there whatsoever. There's no moral part to it. Uh, your enemy's enemy might be a bigger bastard than your enemy. You know? um, and it just it's as ludicrous as... Yeah, I guess that's evil. It's as evil as saying my country right or, right or wrong, you know. In that case, nothing that your country can do can ever be wrong then. That's just despicable. So there's no genocide, there is no amount of mass murder or torture uh, that can be carried out that you won't disagree with. That's just an utterly, utterly bizarre and, and genuinely evil sort of attitude. But do you believe in moral progress or are we in, are we in an arrested phase at the moment? I think <laughs> the clutch is slipping at the moment, put it that way. Um, I believe in moral progress, yes, of course. I mean, uh, Steven Pinker brought, uh, I can't remember the name of the book now, but um, arguing that you know, we, we are gradually doing better. Fewer people are dying, despite all the mayhem and the, the horribleness of which we see so much nowadays you know, because of you know, media bringing it right to you. Um, you know, we, are, we are killing fewer of ourselves, as it were. So, yeah, there's moral progress. We've still got a way to go. You know, I'm not sure you'd be getting much more than a C on the report card, but... Uh, absolutely, yes, of course there's moral progress. But uh, have you been extravagant? I mean, you are, you have in the past and have slightly returned to being a petrol head, but you mm. were a petrol head in the past, weren't you? Oh, hell yeah. Um, yeah, um, well, yeah, it's this idea that um, because I'm going to be saving in all this carbon uh, usage over the next you know, 20 or 30 years, uh, with a simple you know, medium of dying, um, I thought, yeah, I could, I could indulge myself. So yes, we have, uh, we have an M5 now. <clears throat> this is a BMW M5. BMW M5 V10 engine, 500 of your earthbreak horsepowers. By the side of Loch Fyne, I head north again and back down Glendaril, finally having to press on once more as I've ever so slightly underestimated the time required again and so end up gunning the Defender up the long curving slopes towards the viewpoint looking out over the Kyles of Butte. This is one of the best views in Argyll, maybe one of the great views of Scotland, a vast opening delta of ragged joining lochs, flung arcs of islets and low-hilled island disappearing into the distance. 
And do you plan to drive very fast? Uh, oh, yes. No, not uh, irresponsibly fast, but well, that would be wrong. Um, but yeah, there's certain. Doesn't really matter if you can't a speeding ticket now, though, does it? Ah, uh, that's true, actually. But that that need to get that kind of adrenaline buzz. Um, you used to get that through drugs as well. A bit, yeah. I've I've got old, so and I don't. I've kind of gone off my drugs, which is quite a shame, you know. And I had to stop taking cocaine. Well, two reasons. One was simply that it was bad for my heart. I used to get uh, occasionally get arrhythmia anyway, but it did that, you know, um, kind of guaranteed that. But also, I just got so disgusted by the, 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 the morals of the trade and the amount mm. of cruelty and murders that. that take place. Yeah. You just couldn't. You know, I just found it morally insupportable to, to even think about doing cocaine again. So. But in terms of the fast cars, I mean, that, yeah. that, was, that, that was very much the excess of the era. You, you, could never, you could never so mix the two. Of I was going to say, yes, thing. you could never mix, yeah, presumably, yeah. the cocaine and the fast cars. But yeah. on the fast cars bit, I mean, you, you could do that. I mean, here you were on the left, but you were running mm. around in kind of Porsches. Oh, yeah. Well, I've never understood this thing about champagne socialists. So, you know, a Tory's not allowed to swig beer, I think you'll find they are, you know, so there's nothing wrong with that whatsoever. Um, as I say, overpaid, got to get rid of it. You know, I can't, uh, we, you know, we're quite good with cozies and, uh, you know, churdies and that sort of thing. But, um, yeah, the money's there to be spent and, uh, and we've got some savings and so on. But um, do what you enjoy and I just bloody love fast cars <laughs> but accompanying the fast cars is the mm. music mm. and music's you know been a real uh, importance to in your mm. in your life i mean but lots of people would say that but for you particularly because you can r listen to music when you write and so forth um and has that been something that's given you solace just now um i'm thinking the solace is going to come because I, I write music you know i have pretensions towards being a composer uh and that's what I intend to spend most of my creative energies on in the next couple of months or however long I've got, uh, is, uh, is writing music and trying to get to some level of presentability so it'll actually be you know, accessible. Until now, this had been a private pastime for Ian, but he was ready to share it. OK, take me through what we have here. Well, this says it's a list of songs. These are, at this All point, composed most composed by of, you? Uh, oh, yeah. Uh, that's the whole idea. <laughs> so the first about 60 songs go way back. They go back to when I was at university and just, you know, plonking away on a guitar and uh, inventing my own form of musical notation as well. <laughs> you, don't, you, don't, you, don't, you don't read that much music. I can, I can read it very, very slowly now, you know, but to the point, there's no real point. And the thing about it, the software that I'm using here is you just don't need to. There's simply no, need, no requirement whatsoever. Um, so a uh, very, very simple little song. Um, you can see it's quite, you know, it's only got a few tracks okay. going, but it's got the different um, instruments shown there. <laughs> Simple as simple can be. And on it goes, much like that. So I have a slight fetish for using as few <laughs> instruments as possible, keeping the whole thing looking nice on the screen. It's probably completely irrelevant. Um, but you might take something like Yeah, because looking nice bit. on the screen, presumably, has no relation it's to really how it sounds. nothing <laughs> whatsoever to do with it, you know. But um, I try to get away without using chords, um, because everyone else uses chords and starts from chords. So this is your own um, kind of modernism, is uh, it? You could call it that if you wanted to dignify the process, <laughs> yes. Uh, <laughs> it's probably trying to stay away from the things that everybody else does. So you're, I'm trying to produce something that is going to sound a bit, what, relatively Banksian. unique. Banksian, if you like, yeah. So this is the symphony, what I wrote. And I'm, but, well, I'm still slightly in the course of writing because mm -hmm. it, it needs further tinkering with, because uh, it's such a long piece, you know, there's always more you can do. It's a bit like a novel. A short yes. story be, can, can be completely finished. A novel, in a sense, but can always be finished. look at that. It looks so different from everything yeah. else. Yeah. Uh -huh. God, it looks so complex. Well, that's because it is. <laughs> um, This is the start of the second movement. Uh, it's a bit that I'm, I feel is the most finished of all, all the different movements. Um, it's a bit of actually like people here, you know. <laughs> There's a 
little Scottish. Yeah, I think there's a sort of Scottish influence in there, yeah. Because it's been a hobby, it's been more fun than the writing. As the writing has, well, it's how I, you know, I earn my keep, basically. And uh, as, you know, so my career depends on the writing and in, in a small way, you know, part of my, you know, it's my, my publishers and uh, bookshop owners and so on, and, and just your public, people who actually are fans, you don't want to let them down. Because I can just do what I damn well please. Well, that's always been the case, you know, sort of until now. Um, this was a hobby, it was simply meant to be uh, a giggle. Uh, the only sad thing is that I, I, you can't really do both at the same time. I can't write because I'm staring at a screen all day. The last thing I want to do is come and you know, stare at a screen for the next two or three hours, you know, for, uh, of me time, as it were. Um, so I, I can only really do one at a time. So now that they, that, that's it, basically, with, with the writing, um, I can devote myself more to this, you know. Uh, and even if no one ever hears it or no one ever enjoys it, it'll be fun for me. It will be genuinely th therapeutic. I just have such a, such a hoot with this. But did writing, did it always come easily to you? Mm. It appears to come easy. I mean, you, you write so quickly. Do you have... Hey, well, yeah, I say fairly. You know, it doesn't really feel... I only really... I'm only at the typeface <laughs> for three months a year. The rest of the time is my own, you know. Um, so, yeah, well, I just find I like to get, get it out of the way as fast as I can. I just want to, you know, go on. I'm, I get caught up in it. And I can't really slow down. I just I've, I really need to, to get going. But when you're working, when you're writing, is it all consuming? I mean, you just think about your characters all the time. Pretty much, yeah. I mean, at the same time, I do try to write office hours. So I've got time to socialise in the, in the evening if necessary and uh, have weekends away with our pals, you know. Mm. So... It's not that totally all-consuming. Uh, I remember in the old days when I was working with um, uh, just you know, sheets of paper and a, and a manual typewriter, uh, I'd think, right, OK, I'm going, today I'm going to write 15 pages. And I'd get to the end of that 15th page and stop. You know, I didn't sort of go on to the... No matter it was in the middle of a sentence or some highly emotionally charged bit, so ah, that's it, I know where I'm going. And I'd start off tomorrow. It's never never been a problem, because you, you fit instantly back into mm -hmm. where you were. And what about your workings? Do you have lots of workings? Um, yes, but I don't show them. Um, Ever? <laughs> well, no, I mean, I don't... Yeah, there's, there's sort of notes, and there's all sorts of... You know, it's all in electronic form these days, I guess, but... Um, although I do print them out, but... Um, yeah, there's usually you know, quite a lot. Well, I don't know, maybe 20, 30 pages, maybe. Culture novel, 40 pages, because it's more complicated. Uh, and that's just the initial... Ideally, what you want is that's one page. It should all be about one page where you describe the whole plot of the book uh, in whatever you know, degree of brevity. Um, and that way you always know where you're going. You can see it just in one sort of glance. Um, but can you all... But it changes, does it not? Or does yours uh, not change? They're not supposed to change too much. The little blighters, no. Uh, the idea is you've done your planning properly, then you just go with that. You're kind of ready just to, to head off. Uh, Obviously, the little extra things come, come to you as you write, write it, and dialogue is always invent, you know, invented right there. It's you know, just in time production, as it were. Uh, but everything else should really have been thought out beforehand. So you never sort of find yourself writing yourself into a, into a corner or, or realizing you killed that character off four chapters ago. So why are you writing about him now? You know? And of course, you want the quarry out fast because you want to sell lots of books. Uh, I wanted to hold a copy. I might not be around in October, you know. So, being able to bring it back to yeah to June is uh, forward to June rather is uh, just superb. Um, well, yeah, uh -huh, yeah, it makes it makes sense. And the fact that it's you know, it although it does start to look at a cunning plan of mine, doesn't it? I'll pretend I've got cancer. I'm actually fine and dandy. I'm hale and healthy. Nothing wrong with me. Um, and that way, I'll sell more books out of sympathy. If only that were good. <laughs> Are you still writing? Uh, no, no. Um, I'm going to try and get the plot for the next culture novel together so that just in case um, there is some sort of you know, miracle cure or whatever, I don't get to the end of the year going, ha-ha, beat your cancer. 
oh god I haven't got a book to write oh no you know so um I'll do it just for that but also there's a very slim possibility you know that might maybe somebody else could actually write it but I don't know I'm not how sure do you feel about that uh mixed feelings you know mm. um in a way it'd be better for it to Britain well, it depends on the books I haven't actually got the, the full suite of ideas yet for a start you know but um are there any things you wish you'd done differently um, and done differently. I don't know. I mean, I, I kind of. That's one of those questions when you think, well, when you when you have a working time machine, you know, <laughs> then we'll look at that seriously. So, uh, I, that's not really much point. I don't. I don't have many regrets in my life. Um, uh, I suppose I. Oh, like a lot of men, I've hurt women and didn't need. To, well, when I was being selfish, or uh, there's um, a degree of uh, heart towards X ex-girlfriends, you know, that probably didn't need to have happened, but um, that's probably the greatest series of regrets in my life. Um, but other than that, certainly professionally, not really, no. Do you think that you are a selfish person? Oh, I know I'm a selfish person, yeah. That's why I try so hard to be nice. You know, it's, you know, it's, it's compensation in a way, you know. I think, I mean, there's, uh, being raised as an only child and one is, who's who was kind of made to feel special as well, in, in a sense. Um, and just being an only child, but also being, you know, living in your head as much as you do when you're a writer. And I think that kind of makes you selfish in a way, you know. But having said that, I don't want to make excuses for myself. I'm just a naturally selfish person anyway. But um, I do try to, you know, compensate for it by being, you know, nice to everybody else. <laughs> what? will happen to the Ian Banks archive? Um, I don't know. I think, I think I got a letter the other day from Scottish National Library, but I can't remember if it was... I haven't properly dealt with it. I haven't replied to it, certainly. Uh, I can't remember if that was about everything or whatever. Uh, archive sounds so grand, doesn't it? You know? uh, I suppose if it was going to go to, you know, um, educational establishment, it would be Stirling. That's, Stirling yeah. University, where we were. Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. um, I haven't really given it the amount of thought it obviously des it deserves and it needs, but uh, I will have it, I'll have a think, yeah. And might there be an Ian Banks or an Ian M. Banks Foundation? <laughs> no, I don't think so, no. <laughs> <laughs> so have you made plans for your death? Um, I've had a thought about, I, mean, I, I guess it would just be the, the local crematorium. Um, Adele has then promised to scatter my ashes in the Grand Canal in Venice, just a small amount, you know. Uh, but, but in secret, if necessary, I don't know what the, the bylaws are. Grand Canal in Venice, uh, in front of a certain um, cafe in Paris, uh, put something to a rocket to be fired over the fourth. Uh, again, quite a small amount. And uh, oh yeah, and someone to a beach in Barra, or Barra Vatici, whatever. But not too much any, any of that. And most of them will actually remain in the urn and be sunk where my dad's ashes are sunk in, uh, in Loch Shiel. So wait a minute, some are going into fireworks, so uh -huh. Ian Banks is actually going to be fired into the universe? Oh yeah, well, into the, into the fourth, yeah, mm, yeah, into the, still within, remaining entirely within the, uh, the atmosphere, I'm afraid, but yeah. Ian Banks, thank you very much. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs>